Our last lesson, the lesson for our sermon tonight, is our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 18. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is God's word. Friends of Jesus, I decided that over these six Wednesdays of Lent, we're going to talk about the seven deadly sins. You heard of those before? Could you list some of the seven deadly sins? You can. I wasn't expecting anybody to say something. And you did. This is good. And you said some of them. Pride, greed, anger, envy, lust, gluttony, laziness. Does that sound familiar? They go way back into Christian history. It seems like already in the first centuries after Jesus was on earth, Christians started to identify some sins as especially dangerous to us and to our faith in Jesus. This, this list of seven, the seven deadly sins, that was already put down in writing in the 500s. For 1,500 years, Christians have found it useful to warn each other about the seven deadly sins. When I told somebody that we were going to focus on the seven deadly sins, their, their first reaction was, isn't that a Catholic thing? And the answer is, kind of. Catholic Church does talk about the seven deadly sins, and so as we talk about them, we have to make something clear first. How many sins are deadly? All of them. Every single sin is deadly. Every single sin can separate our hearts from God. Every single sin deserves God's punishment. And yet, even though every single sin is deadly, it's been helpful for Christians to recognize that there are some sins that in a powerful, dangerous way lead to even more sins. I'm going to rattle off those seven deadly sins again. I want you to notice how these seven deadly sins aren't actually actions. They're all attitudes of the heart. Attitudes of the heart that are the root of all the other sins that we commit. Pride, greed, anger, envy, gluttony, laziness, lust. In this line, we're going to get at the heart. At the heart with the seven deadly sins. Tonight on Ash Wednesday, we're going to start with the greatest sin of all. And that's the sin of pride. Last century, there was a famous Christian named C.S. Lewis. You heard of C.S. Lewis? He wrote a little book about Christianity called Mere Christianity. And in that little book, he has a chapter all about pride. And do you know what the title he gave that chapter was? The Great Sin. The Great Sin is pride. I think Jesus would agree. Jesus talked often about the danger of pride. He even, he even told a parable about it. It was our lesson tonight. And the introduction to that parable describes pride in a perfect way. It says, To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else. What type of person is that? Proud. Those words from the Bible tell us that there's two ugly parts to pride. One part of pride is self-righteousness. The trust in your own righteousness. The other part of pride is judging others, looking down on everybody else. And Jesus gives us a picture of what that looks like. So there were two men who went up to the temple to pray. 
a Pharisee and a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Would be one word you could use to describe that Pharisee? Proud. Remember the two ugly parts of pride? Self righteousness? What did that Pharisee say? I fast twice a week, give a tenth of all I get. Look at how good I am. What was the second part? Looking down at others? What did that Pharisee pray? God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Proud. It's pretty easy to see, isn't it? Actually, one of the dangers about pride is that pride is almost impossible to see in yourself. Almost nobody considers themselves proud. You know, of course, that we don't like to confess any of our sins. It takes God motivating us to do that. But I think there's people who sometimes confess that they struggle with anger or maybe with alcohol. Have any of you ever sat down with another Christian and confessed, I am really proud? I doubt many of us have done that. Because pride is one of the hardest sins to identify in ourselves. Of course, pride is one of the easiest sins to identify in other people. Right? Nothing irks us more than when other people act like they're better than us. Than when other people look down their noses at us This is what makes pride dangerous. It's one of the hardest sins to identify in ourselves and one of the easiest sins to identify in other people. And so today, God wants us to be able to diagnose pride in ourselves. Remember the two ugly parts of pride? First of all, looking down on everybody else. Pride, by its very nature, is very competitive. Does that describe you? You see, pride isn't content just to have things. Pride always wants to have more than somebody else. It's not about being beautiful. It's about being more beautiful than she is. It's not about being successful. It's about being more successful than he is. It's not about winning games. It's about winning more games than they do. See how destructive pride can be? What pride does is it immediately pits us against every other person as if we're in a a competition. Pride is at the root of all the conflicts we see in our families, in relationships, and in our worlds. But that was one ugly part of pride, looking down on other people. Remember what the other part of pride was? Self-righteousness. Pride finds a way to make life all revolve around me or you. You think about yourself. You think about what other people think about you. And then you wonder why other people don't think about you more. Because what does all of life revolve around? You. Does this sound familiar? Actually... Pride's not content with that. It's not enough just to have all of life revolve around you. Who needs to be the hero of the story? You do. Because you are, right? I mean, you're the hero of the story, right? How often don't you think to yourself, why why don't people see how good I am? Why don't people reward all the good work that I'm doing? Why won't more people just be like me? That sound familiar? I have to say, it's really hard for me to preach about this. Because you know who I'm preaching to? I'm preaching to me. Do you know why? Because I'm proud. I bet some of you are listening and you can relate to this too. But I bet there's some of you who are listening and you're thinking to yourself, I know people like that. (laughs) No! You still don't get it yet. All right, let me, let me try a little bit more. All right, on the one hand, we often think about how good we are, but I bet there's moments in your life 
When you think about how bad you are, you feel like you're the worst person. When you feel like you can't do anything right. In those moments, do you know what you are? Proud. Do you know what? Because who are all those thoughts still revolved around? You. Do you realize this? There's, there's more than one way to make life revolve around you. If you think really highly of yourself and you boast about yourself, you're proud. But if you think really low of yourself and you always complain about yourself, do you know what you are? You're proud. There's more than one way to make life all about me. How often don't we yearn and crave attention from, from other people? So we should think about this. Have you ever noticed that the parts of your body only seek attention when there's something wrong? Like when does your elbow ever call out for attention? Only when what happens? When you bang your funny bone, right? When do your teeth cry out for attention? Only when they hurt. You need to go to the dentist. When, when does your appendix cry out for attention? Only when it bursts and you need some life-saving surgery and your body parts only cry out for attention if there's something that's very wrong with them. And See what I'm saying? When you and I are constantly yearning for other people's attention, sometimes good, sometimes bad, when we're constantly yearning for attention, what does that show us about ourselves? There's something wrong. We're proud. And here's the greatest danger. Pride doesn't just hurt our relationships with other people. Pride also destroys our relationship with God. And here's why. Remember, pride is always trying to be more than and better than and always at the center of everything. And so what happens when a person trying to be more than and better than at the, and the center of everything runs into God? It's going to be a crash. Because God is infinitely superior to all of us. God and pride cannot exist again. Because if I think that I'm good... I don't know God. If I think that I'm always right, I don't know God. If I think that I should be at the center, I don't know God. See, when C.S. Lewis calls pride the great sin, what he means is that pride is the greatest anti-God attitude in the world. And here's the biggest problem for you and me. It's especially dangerous for religious people. Know anybody like that? It's especially dangerous for people like the Pharisees. It's sad in the Bible to read about the Pharisees. It's sad because the Pharisees were good. The Pharisees were religious. The Pharisees were more moral than everybody else. Does that sound familiar? Is that often how we classify ourselves? Good? More moral? Religious? And yet what did the Pharisees do? They crucified Jesus. Why? Because there was no room in their proud hearts for a king. There was no room in their proud hearts for repentance. Pride is the most dangerous for religious people. If you ever walk out of our church and think to yourself, I'm better than them, you must have heard a sermon from the devil. For that Pharisee to stand up and say, God, I thank you that I'm not like one of those. That's what a Pharisee says who is on the path to hell. You see the problem? You see why C.S. Lewis would say pride is the great sin? Maybe the greatest challenge to human beings in our relationship with God? Well, thankfully in Jesus' story, there was another person. Who else does he talk about? Tax collector. A sinner. 
I'm told that the tax collector, he, he stood off at a distance. He didn't even want to look up to heaven, but he beat his chest and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I hope you can see this is totally different. The tax collector didn't talk about his goodness like the Pharisee did, but the tax collector also didn't dwell on his badness, although he confessed that he was sinful. Do you know what the tax collector was thinking about? Listen again. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. What what was the tax collector thinking about? The mercy of God. You see the difference? Here's the Bible's message. The Bible says that you and I are so sinful that it took God himself dying on a cross to save us. Listen to that again. You and I are so sinful, it took God himself dying on a cross to save us. Do you believe that? If not, you're, you're proud. But you know, if you believe that, it changes everything. You and I are so sinful that God himself died on the cross to save us. If that's true, do you know how special you are? You are so special that God himself died on the cross to save you. You know, when when you act out of your pride, you can spend your whole life trying to impress one other person and it can still be a failure. But what the Bible tells you is that you don't have to try to impress anybody. Instead, even now, right now, to God, you're so precious that that you're worth his life. Jesus talks about that. At the end of his parable, he, he uses a very special word from the Bible. See if you can catch it in what I say. Talking about the tax collector, Jesus said, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. What do you think the special word was? Justified. Do you know what justified means? It means declared not guilty. That sinful tax collector, in the eyes of God, he was justified. He was declared not guilty. He was saved. He was forgiven because this is how it works in God's kingdom. It's not about impressing God or doing all the right things. It's it's about a humble heart that repents of its sin and trusts in God's mercy. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't love you because you're beautiful. It's God's love for you that makes you beautiful. You're lovely because Jesus loves you. See the difference that makes? I I heard a a sermon from a famous pastor in the United States who would carry around a note card in his wallet. On one side of the note card, he had written some questions. And he said almost every day he he would read these questions to himself. And they went like this. Whom are you trying to impress? Whom are you worried about judging you today? What are you doing to try to get attention from others. What are you doing today to try to make yourself look good? Can you guess what he was doing? Every day he was convicting himself of something. What was he convicting himself of? Pride. Every day he wrestled with pride. All he had to do was ask those questions. But then he would flip the card over. On the other side of the card he had just written one sentence. One little sentence in all capital letters. Do you know what it said? The court is adjourned. You understand why he would say that? You know, because of Jesus Christ, life is not a courtroom. Every day is not a day for you to try to impress others or to impress God. The message of the Bible is that you have been justified, which means the court is adjourned, which means your sins are forgiven which means you're saved, you're forgiven, you are, you are loved by God. Every time all those questions come into your mind, how, how do I impress them? How do I look? What are they thinking about me? You've got to put that card over and remind yourself, the court is adjourned. 
You have peace with God now, today, because of Jesus. It's, it's the grace of God in Jesus that undoes the pride in our hearts. A few weeks ago in our children's devotion here at, on Sunday at church, I, I told the kids that the Bible tells adults that they need to be more like children. Does anybody remember why? Children are really good at something that God wants adults to be good at too. Somebody remember? Somebody's got to remember. My self-esteem depends on it, right? Because I'm proud and I really need your, I really need you to remember. What I told the kids is kids are good at something very important and it's receiving gifts. Kids are really good at receiving gifts. You see, when, when someone gives adults a gift, what do we immediately think? How am I going to pay them back? Or, I don't need this. I've got enough. Or, I've got to do something else to make this right. What are all of those thoughts in our minds? Pride. It's all pride. When a little child receives a gift, what does she say? Cool. Thanks. This is what Lent, this is what repentance, it's all about. It's letting God's word beat down that sinful pride in our hearts so that we're able to receive the gift of God's grace and God's mercy, it's a gift. Our prayer during Lent as we meet these Wednesdays is that God would give us the humility of that tax collector to say, God, have mercy on me. A sinner, he didn't focus on the good things he had done. He also didn't focus on the bad things he had done. What did he focus on? The mercy of God. God, have mercy on me. A sinner, our prayer is that the Lord Jesus Christ would give us humble hearts that trust in his mercy because you're free. I hope you realize that. You're free. You're free from having to think highly of yourself. You're also free from having to think low of yourself. In fact, you are free from having to think about yourself. You're free to rejoice in the mercy of God. And there's nothing better. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, you and your word, you, you convict us of lots of different sins. But the more we study your word, we realize that there's one sin that's particularly dangerous to our faith, and it's the sin of pride. Dear Lord, as hard as it is for us to see pride in ourselves, your, your word points it out. We have to confess tonight for all the times that we've trusted in our own righteousness. We thought we're good. We ask you to forgive us tonight for all the times we've looked down on others. And we said to you like that Pharisee, God, I'm glad I'm not like those people. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive us for the pride in our hearts. Free us from making life revolve around us so that we can see how your life revolved around us. You gave your life to set us free from sin and death and the devil. Your death on the cross was a declaration that the court is adjourned, that we're justified and forgiven through faith in you. Dear Jesus, free us to live lives of humility for you. In your name we pray. Amen.